Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And what a wonderful privilege it is. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what a wonderful Savior he is. And the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And what a wonderful, precious gift from God it is. Well, friends, today is December the 20th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and we're going to start to pick up some momentum here because what we're going to do, obviously, the Old Testament is a very large book, and it contains many stories. And so rather than go verse by vo verse from this point forward, what we're going to do is we're going to touch each major story and look at what it is that the Lord would have us to learn from that. For as we know from the book of Hebrews, all these things were written for us so that we could gain insight by learning both from what they did and what they didn't do and what we should do as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and what we shouldn't do what we should pursue and run to, and what we should flee from. Now, in having just left the story of the flood, we pick up in chapter 9, and we're going to move rather quickly through this, but we pick up in chapter 9, and the very first thing we see is that God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. The earth is empty. There are only eight human beings alive on planet Earth. And so a new world has begun, and these will be the fathers of that world. Now God says in verse 2 that man is to have dominion over all the creatures of the Earth. And in verse 3 he says, Over every moving thing that liveth, it shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I have given you all things. So now God has said... Unlike what he said the first 2,000 year period, God has said the creatures of the earth, the animals of the earth, are now given to you for meat, for food. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Now God says in verse 9, as you begin this new world, I'm going to establish a covenant with you and with all those who come after you. He says in verse 11, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, nor will I destroy the earth again by flood. And as a sign of the token of the covenant which I've made between me and you and every living creature on earth, I will set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Now notice that the rainbow isn't necessarily a token a sign of the covenant for men, it's for God. We see that again in verse 16 when it says, the bow shall be in the cloud and I, God, will look upon it that I, God, may remember the everlasting covenant between me and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now in verse 18, we pick up with the sons of Noah and it says, the sons of Noah that went forth out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now Ham is the father of Canaan, and these are the three sons of Noah. Over them was the whole earth overspread. So it would appear from that verse that the sons of Noah are going to spread across the earth and are going to begin what we would consider nationalities today. Now Noah began to be a husbandman or a farmer, a tiller of the land. And so he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine from that vineyard and he became drunk and was uncovered within his tent. Now let us recognize here that this is the first time that we've seen such an event take place in the life of Noah, a righteous man before God, and it is the last time. Now it also says that Noah began to be a husbandman. So it would appear that this is the first time that he began to work the land. And maybe he didn't realize the potency that came from the vine. And because of this, he became drunk. It would appear because we never read of this again or hear about this again that Noah learned from that first mistake. He learned of the potency, the poison within the vine, and he never allowed himself 
to become controlled by the vine, the fruit of the vine, ever again. Now, this is speculation, but Noah being a righteous man, it would appear to be so. But as he lay drunken within his tent, notice verse 22, it says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth, they took a garment, they laid it upon their shoulders, they walked backwards, and they covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Notice what it says, friends. Knew what his younger son had done unto him. Had done unto him. Apparently, Ham not was only guilty of looking upon his father's nakedness, desiring his father's nakedness, but he did something to him while he was drunk. And so when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his younger son had done unto him. He said, because of what you have done, cursed be Canaan, cursed be Ham, and all that will come from him. He will be a servant of servants, and he shall be a servant unto his brothers. And so Noah is cursing the lineage of Ham, and the lineage, all who will come from Ham, will be servants unto all who will come from his brothers, Shem and Japheth. Now, I have to admit to you, I don't understand or know fully the nations that came from these three young men, and the Bible doesn't seem to draw much significance about those nations either. It pinpoints and focuses in on the nations that came from Ham, the lineage from Ham. Now, chapter 9 ends by saying, all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So men lived a very long time upon the earth during those days. But we're going to see some changes in this new world, the food that man can partake of, the law of God given to men, which at, up to this point had never been given. And we're going to see a decrease in the years that man lives upon the earth because the wickedness of man that lies within his heart from his birth, God can only tolerate so much, so he decreases the years of man. Now we pick up in chapter 10 and we're going to go through the lineage of Noah's sons. It says, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now unto them were born sons after the flood. And it goes into a long list of those that were born from these four men. And in verse 5 it says, these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. And then notice, it starts with the lineage of Ham, the sons of Ham, the cursed one who saw his father's nakedness and did something to his father that he should not have done. From Ham was Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Ramah and Septica. And the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dinan. And Cush begat Nimrod. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time at this point in this study on this man, Nimrod, but he plays a very significant in both folklore and biblical history. And so I would highly encourage you to do a study. Go to Google, look up the name Nimrod, begin with a very simple reading of Wikipedia and learn who Nimrod was because Nimrod is the father of all pagan beliefs and all pagan nations. He is the first world leader, and his heart is defiled. He is set against God. He's focused upon the needs of man, the desires of man, rather than the needs and the desires of God. And it tells us in verse 8, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So all men recognized his might. They recognized his stature, his prowess. And because of this, they worshiped him. Now the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel, which will come from Babel later, Babylon. Which if you know anything about Old Testament history, Babylon is the number one enemy of the people of God. And so we began to see the curse that was placed upon him by Noah being lived out very early on. Now Canaan beget in verse 15, Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. 
And notice this, because you're going to hear about these nations throughout the rest of the story very often. Canaan became the father of the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, the Archites, and the Sinites, the Arvidites, and the Zimmerites, and the Hamathites, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. These were all pagan nations that the people of Israel battled from this day forward throughout their entire history, friends. And if you were to trace the lineage backwards, you would find that this is where the people of Iraq, Palestine, and other such nations come from. And they are at war with one another simply because of what Ham did to his father and the curse that Noah placed upon him for doing so. Now in verse 19, the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. Now we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're going to talk about that much more in detail at a later date when we come upon that story in our progression through the Bible. But it shouldn't surprise us that the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, who did such evil acts before the Lord, were from the lineage of Ham. Now, as we end the chapter in verse 32, it says, These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. And so in these lineages and in these divisions upon the earth, we can see where the nations of the earth came from. Now, as we pick up in chapter 11, it says, The whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And from the brick they created stone, and from the slime they created mortar. And they said among themselves, Go to, let us build us a city and tower, whose top may reach unto heaven." and let us make a name for ourselves. You see, that's what lies in the heart of man, to elevate himself. He himself wants to be worshiped, wants to be adored, wants to be recognized. And so these people say, let us make a city that we may make a name for ourselves. Now, let me ask you a question. When God created man, did he put him in a city? No, he put him in a garden, in his creation. God isn't the creator of cities. Man is the creator of cities. And in the cities, we see much defilement. I've never seen a casino on a farm. I've never seen a strip joint on a farm. I've never seen a local bar on a farm. I've never seen a disco on a farm. I've never seen a movie house on a farm. It's only in the city that you will find these things. God created man to be a worker of the earth, not to sit behind a computer or in a cubicle, or in an office building. These are all the developments and the creations of man. And so in verse 5, it says, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that men were building. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one. They all have one language. And unless we intervene, nothing will be restrained from them. All that they imagine to do, they will be able to do. So let us go down. Now notice he says, let us. Is he speaking about Michael and Gabriel? Or is he speaking specifically of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, he says, let us go down and confound their language, confuse their language, separate the languages that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from over the face of the earth and they stopped building the city. Now, the name of the city that they were building is called Babel. You'll remember from chapter 10, verse 10, that that is the city that Nimrod created, that Nimrod appeared to be king over. And so the Lord confounded their language over all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, in the remainder of the chapter, we're going to see the descendants of Shem, the second son of Noah. And it tells us in verse 23 that Sarug, who was a descendant of Shem, lived after he begat Nahor 200 years, and he begat sons and daughters. Nahor lived 920 years and begat Terah. 
Terah lived 70 years and beget Abram, a very key figure both in the story of the Bible and among the Jewish people and even to us as Christians, as followers of the Lord Jesus. Because Abram is later going to become Abraham and he's going to become the father of the faith. Now in verse 28, it says, Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. Now the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. Now does Canaan ring a bell? Well, Canaan was the name that was used for Ham. And so they went to the land of the pagans. And they came unto Haran, and they dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So they lived in Ur, they're traveling to Canaan, which is now an occupied land of the pagan nations. They came to Haran, and they dwelt there. Now in our next time together, we'll pick up in chapter 12, which is going to pick up the story of Abram, and we're going to follow this very closely early on. But I think from the lesson this morning, what we can draw out is the fact that it's in men's heart to worship themselves, to build and to plan, to create and to learn, never to be satisfied with the simplicity that comes in serving God, but pushing themselves to always become better and greater. And so I think it's important as God's followers to stable ourselves and to stop the desire to always have more, always be more. Instead of always pursuing busyness, to be still and know that he is God. Hallelujah. And friends, this may be the hardest thing that you have ever taken unto yourself, but it is a quality that we as the people of God need to pursue. We need to seek and we need to discipline ourselves unto. Oh, that God would help us, friends, that instead of building and establishing things to make a name for ourselves, let us be still and always, always redirecting all the worship that would come to us, redirecting it unto the Lord, who truly is the only one that deserves such attention, adoration, and worship. Well, may the Lord Jesus bless your journey today, friends. May your heart be hungry for his word. May your soul be full of his praise. And may your hands be busy about his work. Now, as he wills and until next time, I truly love you, friends. And I'll see you on the next video.